I will, I will give a, an example tomorrow. Okay. Exactly this sort of tension. Uh, a Colombian student found a striking new species and was most of the way through describing it and even submitted the paper. These papers sometimes take months to get considered. An NGO found out about this, went out, captured the same species, and shall we say very quickly, put together a description and published it in-house. And so they published it like that and beat the student's publication, which was done properly by about three months. Anyhow, we'll go into that, that example and what happened from it uh, tomorrow in great detail. Dave, right? Okay. I'd say there's also a precedent for uh, two levels of contribution. So sometimes there, are, uh, this happens in some of the, at least the animal literature that I know, uh, where you can have a, a number of authors that participate as the authors of the publication, but then the authority is a subset of those authors, right? So you may have 10 authors that are all the people that participated, including the one person that you know gave one specimen of something. But then only one or two of those, or some subset of those people, are the people that actually did the scientific work you know, describing it. So they're acknowledged in terms of being on the publication, but not as the authority. And you can have papers sometimes where there's 10 authors, and then two of them are the authors of this species, two of them are the authors of a different species, two of them are the authors of different species in the same publication. And that's something that you see regularly in some like larger monographic treatments now. Yeah, I, I guess the only thing I would add is that, um, is that uh, in this increasingly internet-driven, collaborative world that we're in, you know, I think that the, the trend is, is moving towards more and more international collaborations, and that's a great thing. Um, and, and then there's also an increase, a sort of a general trend towards increasing the numbers of authors on papers. And that can either be a good thing if all those people are collaborating, or a bad thing if people are sometimes arbitrarily added to the author. Are you really I okay? Intellectual or some, some sort of substantive resource based contribution to the Thank you, Dr. Fokam, for your presentation. And I have a question. It's not only for you, but, only for, uh, but also for the other scientists. Okay. If a <coughs> student, a graduate, undergraduate, or I don't know, is part of an expedition, he is not providing the money of the expedition, for example. And you are in the field together, and while looking for organisms, I don't know, put, uh, plants, animals, <coughs> anything, and he's the one that collects the specimen. And everybody says this thing might be new. If at the end the, uh, the, the new species is published, and the name of this person is not associated as an auto. What should be done? Because maybe the, 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 side, the, the student may need to be part of the, the description of the, the species as an auto. He may need. He need. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm going to provide my opinion on that and we're going to hear others talk about it, okay? Well, you mentioned the case the person could be an undergraduate or mm -hmm. anything else, a student, yep. right? Now, one thing I want to tell you about publication is that it's not about who, it's not essentially about who provides the resources. And I'm going to quote here an example of something that happened to me. I was spending a little time as a postdoc somewhere, and my mentor sent me to Cameroon to go and to sample for mosquito. He paid for the trip and everything else. And he was paying me a salary as a postdoc. And then we brought some mosquitoes and from them we isolated a new virus. And we were talking about it. When I came back with the sample, he sent me to another professor's lab because he didn't have a permit to work with those mosquitoes. So I worked with the other professor, okay? 
And when we finished, I go to him and ask him, what are we going to do about authority on this? And he asked me, go and talk it over with the professor in the other lab. Because he did not make any scientific input into that work. Okay? Yes, he did not make any intellectual input to that work. And at most, we had to acknowledge his grant that enabled that work to take part, to, I mean, to happen, okay? So it is not about who provides the resource otherwise on all the MSc students here in Cameroon or whatever, your parents who sponsor your, your studies <laughs> will probably be co-authors on whatever papers will come out of it, okay? That was the first step. So I want to now dwell on the role of the student on that work. What did he do? I will try to tell you that, to be fair, so far the way you've told the story, he's not done anything different from what a guide could have done to pick that specimen and bring in. He brought in the specimen. He didn't tell us we have something new because we think that this and that and that are present or absent. He didn't do any science at that level, okay? When you work out, you're probably going to have some field guys through the forest with you. And sometimes if they know what you're interested in, sometimes they are very hardy and they, you know, they very quickly pick up some specimens and help us get lots of specimens. That is not yet the science. Okay, so I want to situate the intervention or the contribution of that student at the level of the science. Did he participate in the discussion leading to the identification, description, and all that? Did he contribute in writing up the document or the manuscript and all? That is where he would probably be requiring to be part of it. If he was on his own expedition, you could be my student and I send you out. Okay, you are no, no student. You could set out and you do field work sometime all alone, all by yourself. Okay? Then you are doing it. Okay? You come back, you discuss with your mentor about what you've obtained. That is the way I want to perceive it. So sometimes when we're talking about authority, everybody must examine themselves and determine if they have made the right input that will justify that they request authority uh, on on scientific publication. That is the way I was trained and that is the way I train my students. I don't know if, or if others have other things to say about it. I'd agree with that and I'll just add one, one thing to it is think about if you're, you have specimens and you're making scientific collections, you're putting them in a museum, do you expect to be a co-author on the paper in a hundred years that describes a new species out of it? No, right? You don't. But in one year, it's a time scale thing, right? It depends on your contribution. So I mean, for us, you know, the specimens that we make freely available through museums, I don't really expect to be an author on them. Even ones I collected as a student for someone else, right? So it depends on that level of contribution you're making to the science. Mm -hmm. really. yep. uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I mean, you refreshed a lot of, a lot of things that uh, were gone off my head, but I want to really I said it's a piece of advice. Okay. So as, as a young a young student doing expedition, what is the first step would you advise anybody that comes across a species and he or she thinks that this thing is what uh, maybe can be uh, new to science? What is the first step the person can take to investigate more on the species? Well, <clears throat> I don't know if I got you right, but you are on an expedition. Yeah. Uh, basically, you have the objective for your expedition right, and then you find something that you think is interesting. Yes. Okay? Well, I want to believe the first step is probably to collect it. No, but prior, prior to that, there are several things you want to do, like uh, you may want to take photographs uh, and uh, uh, be able to probably Try to characterize the environment where you, find, you found it, okay? And uh, here it will now place you within the context of what group of organism you are dealing with, okay? And if you can have access to it, then you probably want to sample some of it, okay? Often you may not be equipped, well, for you to think that it may be something new, it probably means that you have some sort of knowledge in that area. That I want to assure you, you hardly would see a frog and just think it's a new frog if you are not a person with some basic knowledge of, of the group. Everything people discover around here are things that you and I step on every day. 
Okay? But if you don't have the right mind prepared for it, you probably not be able to, to recognize. So basically, yes, you must definitely be in an area where you think where there you have some amount of knowledge. Okay? So you want to probably pick a sample of this and preserve it appropriately following the rules that you as a person in that discipline have to follow. And probably while in the field, if you have the right guide, you may try to confront it to what is already known. And that is a process that people refer to sometimes as identification. And you can identify it to the level that your knowledge will permit you for that moment. Okay? And if you can completely get to the bottom of it, then you can put it aside as not being new. And if not, you could take it back for the time you return to a place where you have access to more material, okay? And some of the steps could be that you send some of the photographs you have. You could email people and ask them if they're willing to look at some stuff you have. And often there are several people, several authorities who are willing to help. At least it's happened with me before. Okay? So you want to obtain as much information as possible and collect the specimen in a way that is meaningful so that it may be used so, uh, subsequently. Anybody else wants to help on that? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. Okay. I just wanted to add something to the plant, um, the botanical sure. of, uh, nomenclature. Yeah, that um, I think in 1998, there was the advent of the angiosperm phylogeny group right. that has come to take um, make use of molecular material mm -hmm. to be able to substantiate classification. And since then, it has been updated. So we have the third group now, APG3, which is basically, and in this system of classification, they no longer talk about classes. Right. We now talk about um, clades. Yeah. So. Yeah, but you, you need to understand what a clade is, okay? Uh, yeah. They talk about clade because they've not been able to name them yet. Because are, a clade is, will simply be a monophyletic group. That is a group that will contain a parent and all its or ancestor and all its descendants, okay? Yes, they are just referring them to clade because that's a general biological term that is meant to include, so meaning they've been able to find, to find or identify clearly some main branches that will include an ancestor that can be traced and all its descendants, okay? And that is why I mentioned at some point that with plant, with the advent of molecular biology, they are rethinking the whole classification of plants all together, okay? And I said we're happy that, well, for animals, while it's also happening, we seem to have a little less confusion than, uh, yeah, than with, with plants at the moment, okay? But there are several groups for which people are having headache, okay? And I'm sure if they was to take, talk to you, what's the most complicated group right now of frogs, Gidev? Nobody knows exactly what they are. Very complicated. Toads? Yeah, we have a lot of toes. So actually, we'll have an example today that's about uh, looking at an evolutionary tree right. and the way in which different ideas about taxonomy are affected by looking at the evolutionary tree. But it's also not clear cut. There's not an actual exactly. straight, right answer. And so Rafe will walk through a few examples of how to make decisions based on having those patterns of relationships available. Yeah, if you can imagine how crazy it was, we for so many years, centuries, we thought fungi, that fungi and plants were very closely related. And today, we like, they are animals. No, I don't want to say that here online. <laughs> but yeah, that's it. They're more closely related to us. colleagues who resemble fungi. <laughs> so, so you see, okay? So we are learning a lot from each time that our tools are getting better. We are also learning a lot and rethinking the whole way we'd be looking at, uh, at information. Thank you. Okay. One more question. Sure. I'm Last here. Last question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a, a, a small thing. 
Um, I think about the giving names to species. I don't know if I have the hard information because I've listened about a guy from Australia naming space from his dog. Naming <laughs> species uh -huh. from his dog. Okay. So, what's your perception of this kind of behavior? Because I think, for me, like sometimes when you are not really well in identifying species, sometimes the names of maybe the, the species name or the genus name can help you to for the for the lo locality of the sp of, of the species. But if a species is, uh, is named for for example Gabonensis, yes, you directly know that it has been named from Gabon. But if somebody gave his dog's name, mm -hmm. maybe Mike, Mikey, or something like that. Yeah, but remember what I told you here. Okay, there's no particular rule about the way you want to name organisms. Basically, you could say something that is completely absurd. As long as you follow the rules for Latinizing it, you'll be free for that. Okay? Yes, and sometimes people will not even tell you why, what was their state of mind at the time. <laughs> yes. Or what is the suggestion from an old conversation that may have put them on the right track on that, and they want to acknowledge it. The whole world will probably not know how they felt at that time but they probably have a logical way of reasoning that took them to give that particular name. Unfortunately, sometimes you may not be present. As I say, somebody could live from something completely, from something completely uh, different from what you are addressing mm -hmm. and be able to get an insight into solving a problem. Mm -hmm. And we want to acknowledge that. It may not mean anything in that field, but as I say, people are really much free to, okay? Now, you say they mention Gabon, but in some cases, people may even completely mistake an area and still name things thinking that they were doing the right, doing the right, you know? The right, the right, the right thing out of it. I can't quote any clear example at this point, but there are, no, there are several of such where people completely making mistakes, had either the right guess or whatever, and that was it. So basically, as long as you follow the rules, okay, it is essentially when the specific name has to be an adjective that it would be meaningful. Are you getting it? When it's supposed to be characterizing it, that is when you can expect the species, but not the genus. The genus name is a noun and will be anything. It is only in case when the specific name is an adjective that you can expect it to be meaningful. Okay, you get to a point where you're going to hear uh, something Amieti and some other one Peretti, and the question is to know why was this one Amieti and the other one Peretti or the other way around? Yeah, I guess the only thing I would add there is that um, um, you know, the principles of the code protect this taxonomic freedom, and um, that's something that a lot of us believe very strongly in because it's this structure that allows for a formulaic and application of the rules to the, to the diversity. Um, and yet, um, the instance that you just mentioned um, involves someone who is considered by the community in a lot of cases to be a taxonomic vandal. Someone who makes <laughs> fun of the situation and exploits that freedom to do absurd things. So in that case, nobody's very happy with that, but um, we, that's sort of the point of the freedom. Okay. Like freedom of speech. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, economic vandalism is unfortunately a real thing, and there's a lot of papers on it. I mean, it's a, you know, it's now a public scientific term. I mean, the economic vandalism. Like, this has been you know, an ongoing problem recently. And there's a lot of, uh, unfortunately, taxonomy is full of some examples of rather bad behavior. Um, and maybe we won't discuss those formally uh, as part of the course, or will. But, um, but you can ask us about those over lunch, and maybe, and uh, how, you know, how those things can be 